Thanks, Denise Big No, I'm with, I'm with Howard Center. Uh, thank you very much to our esteemed panelists who have taken the time to be with us tonight. Uh, we are in very good company, as you can see. And in just a few minutes, they will each introduce themselves as part of tonight's session. But let me at least acknowledge them by name. The Vermont Commissioner of Public Safety, Tom Anderson. Champlain Valley Union Principal, Adam Bunting. City of Burlington Chief of Police, Brandon Del Pozo. Chief Medical Officer of Central Vermont Medical Center, Dr. Patty Fisher. Chittenden County State's Attorney, Sarah George. Howard Center Safe Recovery Program Coordinator, Grace Keller. And the Vermont Commissioner of Health, Dr. Mark Levine. So tonight's format is about an hour presentation, followed um, by Q&A. For your audience participation, we're going to come around. There will be three of us with microphones. And we're going to ask that you please use the microphone both for the courtesy of people here in the room being able to hear um, your question, and then also for our videotape quality. Our videotape will be online within about two to three weeks, um, both at VCAM and at howardcenter.org. We'll end promptly at 7.30. Want to thank uh, our sponsors, our presenting sponsor, uh, Jerry Riley Real Estate, uh, Mike Simino, Jerry Riley, uh, thank you. Mike may be in the room. Our host uh, sponsor who graciously allows us to use this beautiful site, dealer.com, and this is called the, Gaby, uh, the KB Theater internally. Uh, and then, of course, our friends at uh, VCAM. Bill is over there uh, right as you come in the room, and then Joey is up in the purple in the center. Thank you. Uh, the restroom is right around the corner. If you need to come and go, that's fine. If you do need to depart early, we have ushers that will need to help you um, off-site. Your folders are full of information, including bios for tonight's speakers. And I'd like to mention just a couple of things. Uh, one, our opiates conference. It's open to the public. We really want people to attend. Please register. Please share um, with your family, friends, and colleagues. Our suicide prevention resource booklets, everyone has one in their folder. They're also available at howardcenter.org by calling. If you're an educator and you want 50 for your classroom, we'd be happy to oblige. Whatever it is you need, just give us a ring. And then lastly, we do have two additional community education series, uh, one on April 19th at Main Street Landing. It will be a film. And then we'll end here with ADHD scattered across the lifespan on May 10th. So before we move to hear from the panelists, I would like to read a statement that we've prepared about safe injection sites. We are hosting tonight, of course, with the aim of providing the public with access to information, education, and obviously to have the opportunity to ask questions of our esteemed panelists. As a substance use treatment provider, we understand the perceived need for multiple approaches to address opiate use, including safe injection sites as a form of harm reduction. Our safe recovery program offers syringe exchange, free testing for HIV and hepatitis C, free distribution of Narcan, and is the single largest bridge to treatment uh, and recovery other than individuals who self-refer. While safe recovery may be a viable potential host site, we understand further study and evaluation would be required along with the legislature's approval to establish safe injection sites in Vermont. Tonight's session is not a debate, nor is it intended to be an endorsement of the views presented. Rather, we've done our best to create a respectful context for the sharing of a wide range of perspectives. And to that end, it's now my pleasure to introduce someone who needs no introduction. She's a popular and highly regarded radio journalist, known both nationally and here in Vermont, for her work on NPR and VPR. A Harvard-educated native Vermonter whose career in public radio began at NPR in DC and then was later based on the West Coast before her return to Vermont over 10 years ago. Each day she brings us informative interviews, interesting perspectives, and news as host of VPR's award-winning Vermont edition. She's been the recipient of several regional and national awards, including our local and popular Seven Days Daisies for Best Local Radio Host and Best Talk Radio Show. We are so fortunate to have her with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Jane Lindholm. Uh, 
Thanks, Denise. I'm just going to take 20 or 30 minutes here to talk to you before we get to the panel. Um, actually, Perfect. this job today is like a really easy gig for me because I don't get to ask any questions. I sort of am air traffic control, but I'm really interested. We've done some shows about safe injection sites and uh, one of the ways that I try to work as a journalist is to always be curious and always be open to having my mind changed or a new perspective brought in. And so I invite you to think like the host of Vermont Edition tonight as you listen to the panelists and as you think about what question you might want to ask. So let's get right to it. And Tom Anderson, you're first. So why don't you start by introducing oh, yourself and your oh, opening great. statement. Uh, Tom, hi, good morning. Good after evening, everybody. Tom Anderson, <laughs> I am the, uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. So the Howard Senator to Bob Bick, I wouldn't do this for anybody, but Bob, I, I'm doing it. <laughs> um, I am the Commissioner of Public Safety. I've been the Commissioner of Public Safety since January of, of last year. Uh, my background, though, is as a federal prosecutor. I was a federal prosecutor for about uh, 15 years in Vermont. Uh, I was about uh, eight years or so down in Washington, D.C., and returned last uh, January. Uh, one disclaimer before I start, these are the, my views as Commissioner of Public Safety. They don't necessarily uh, reflect the views of the governor, uh, who has, had, has his own uh, views with respect to uh, safe injection sites. And I, and I think as we talk about this tonight, it's important everybody understands that everybody here, no matter what, uh, what stripe we have, what, what background we have, we're all working toward the same goal. We are all working toward the same goal. And that's, the number, and that's reducing the number of people afflicted with this scourge. So how we get there, we, we, but that is a common goal amongst everybody sitting up here tonight. Um, treatment providers, in my last year as Commissioner of Public Safety, I have obtained renewed uh, admiration for what they do. It is a tough job under extremely challenging circumstances. And you know, I've learned a tremendous amount uh, in the last year as Commissioner of Public Safety. Uh, I also have tremendous respect for State's Attorney Sarah George. Uh, for raising this issue and the courage of her convictions. Um, it took guts, and she's taken some heat for it, uh, including from me. <laughs> Only so I, I do admire, uh, I do admire her, uh, the courage of her convictions. So uh, with that said, you know, I really broke this down as, is our safe injection sites good public policy? Um, and I think that's a broader question than whether uh, they are good for those suffering from uh, substance abuse disorders. Is this a good idea for society as a whole? And in my view, and in the view of most law enforcement, which is the view you're going to get from me tonight, um, authorizing the use of heroin or other illegal drugs in so-called safe, safe consumption sites is not good public policy for a number of reasons. First, this approach could be perceived and will be perceived um, as the state sanctioning and condoning and facilitating the illegal possession and use of a very, very dangerous controlled substance. Um, the, ongoing, the ongoing operational cost to run one of these facilities is not insubstantial. It'll be a burden on Vermont taxpayers. The, the Toronto site that is opened or being opened costs about $4.1 million Canadian a year to operate. The uh, facility in Vancouver, which is often held up as the success story of, of sites, is, costs about $3 million Canadian to run uh, per year. It's also not clear what the liability issues would be in running a safe injection site for the, for the medical the providers that will be there, the doctors that might, or the medical professionals that would be uh, dealing with those issues. I also think this sends the wrong message to Vermont youth. Um, and that, the message that I think it sends is if, if the state is helping people use heroin, how bad can it really be? I think that's a message we have to think about that we're sending, sending to, to our children. The other thing I'd say is that most Vermonters support, are very supportive, um, and, and in the year I've been around the state, they're very supportive of treatment and prevention efforts with respect to this uh, opioid epidemic. Uh, I do not think the vast majority of Vermonters will support this. Um, and I think it then creates the potential for division amongst Vermonters who are generally accepting and understand the need for treatment uh, but that this takes it really a step too, a step too far. Um, I'd also point out there are, there are potentially very significant unintended risks. Economics 101 tells us that supply will generally follow demand. Safe injection sites could uh, create a market for all drug dealers to exploit. Remember, these, you still have to get the drug before you go into a, a safe injection site. The drugs are not provided there. They're still bought illegally on the, on the, mar on the black, on, on the, in the drug market. Um, 
So the drug users will have to purchase their drugs on the street and then bring them into the safe injection site for, for use. And also, what happens to the neighborhood that these the safe injection sites are opened up in? Uh, right or wrong, uh, and I make no judgment on that, people, will people want to live in a neighborhood where one of these safe injection sites are located? I'd also point out that these safe injection sites will violate federal law. Federal law makes it, it, makes it illegal to operate any place for the purpose of using a controlled substance and subjects the property to forfeiture under, under federal law. And I think this U.S. attorney has made pretty clear that she's, she does, what she thinks of safe injection sites and how the U.S. attorney's office or the federal government might, might react if they're, if they're opened up. So to me, it's far from clear that these sites in Vermont would bring us closer to our ultimate goal. And that ultimate goal is reducing the number of Vermonters addicted to opioids, uh, including heroin. Uh, in, in my view, the better approach and the one that I think is supported by most Vermonters is to continue to do this, the things that we're doing, the life-saving steps we're doing right now. And that includes providing Narcan to all first responders. It includes focusing our limited resources on preventing the use of opioids and heroin in the first place. That is ultimately the solution to this problem. It is reducing the demand for these drugs. Uh, it's squeezing the pipeline of people getting addicted to drugs, uh, which will then reduce the need for treatment and all the other things that flow from the addiction. That is the ultimate solution to this problem. Um, and also, it, it, to use our, our limited resource in treating those who, who actually seek treatment and want treatment uh, for this disease and supporting, really importantly, supporting those in recovery. So it's not only treatment, but it's the support for people in recovery. And that's where I think the, the, our, our money can be better spent than on safe injection sites. I'd also like to just briefly address some of the claims supporting safe injection sites. The measure of success, in my view, is not whether anyone has died at a safe, a safe consumption site. It would be remarkable to me if anybody had, because at these sites, there are medical personnel. There, are, there is Narcan uh, readily available. To me, the relevant data points are how many people utilizing these facilities have nonetheless died of an overdose? I don't know if there's any good data on that. Um, have the facilities impacted the overall overdose fatalities in the area in which the facilities are located? If we look at Vancouver, which again is presented as the success story in these, the number of overdose deaths between January 2014 and October 31st, 2017 increased nearly 200%. And I'm not aware of any data being collected on overdose death rates of addicts that have used one of these facilities. That's an important data point. The other, the other argument that is often made for, for these is that they are a pathway to treatment. Um, but the limited data, there's very limited data showing how many addicts have been referred to treatment from these sites. But to me, it's, the important measure isn't how many have been referred, it's how many have actually gone into treatment and how many are now in recovery. So the, I, I think the data on just referrals for treatment needs to be followed by how many actually went into treatment and how many are now in recovery. Vermont's done a pretty good job in that regard. I think a, a, a tremendous job based on the work of a lot of people here. And there are people, you know, people that want treatment in Vermont have a ready, can get it now. I mean, we've done a pretty good job of, of getting treatment to folks that uh, need it. Um, so even accepting, is true, even accepting is true that the safe injection sites may provide some benefits to addicts, in my view, those benefits are far outweighed by the perception of the state. The state is normalizing and condoning this conduct by the potential for increased drug trafficking around these sites and by the burden on taxpayers to fund these programs. I'd like to finish with this. Society does not condone tobacco use. It is another addictive substance that kills people. We stigmatize its use. We ban its use in a variety of locations, and we make it as difficult as we possibly can for people to smoke cigarettes. Shouldn't it be more unacceptable, or at least as unacceptable, uh, not to use a deadly drug such as heroin? Shouldn't we make it as equally hard to use heroin as we do to smoke cigarettes? So with that, I, I will conclude. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. And we're going to move right along so we can get to your questions as well. Um, Adam Bunting, CVU principal, is next. Adam. Thanks for having me here. So uh, truth be told, my wife works for dealer.com, and I'm feeling pretty good right now because I know this is a no-tie zone. <laughs> I'm a high school principal breaking the rules, so that feels pretty good. 
Um, I am also about to be the least helpful panelist here. Uh, when I talked to Bob uh, a little while ago, I've, I've been trying to formulate an opinion on safe injection sites, and I find myself uh, fairly torn and uh, hopefully, like Jane, open to, to doing some learning tonight. Uh, I am very clear that I believe in models of harm reduction. There's, uh, I just support that uh, with all of my being. Um, but when it comes to safe injection sites, I'm, I'm equally parts divided, and I find that each one of those parts within me uh, is accompanied by some, some passion. Um, so my opinions uh, aren't formed on any research either, so that's going to not be all that helpful too. Uh, but my opinions are, are formed on some, some experiences and some stories that I've, I've had over the years with dealing with students of uh, CVU. So on one hand, uh, I think about a young man named Nathan, and he helps me, uh, his story helps me be more in support of injection sites. So he was an unusually talented uh, athlete, musician, uh, appeared to have all the advantages of a very supportive family uh, of, of resources. Um, and I coached him and got to know him in the early 2000s. And I think of that period of time, those classes that came through CVU in 2003, four, five, six, uh, typically when I hear that one of those students has passed away, it's from an overdose. Um, I'm encouraged these days that there is a, a much stronger uh, negative stigma attached to uh, borrowing prescription pills from somebody. I think our student, our youth now are much more informed than they were, but that's because they've lost people they've loved and the education has been there. So this young man uh, called me a few years ago under the guise of getting some career advice. I hadn't seen him since he had left CVU and it had been about five years. And what he really wanted to do when we sat down and talk was tell me his story. And the story he shared with me uh, was one that was fairly shocking um, because I was there for, for the beginning of it. And he told me about uh, when he first started using prescription pills while I was coaching him. Uh, he told me about when he went on to uh, college and did very well ac academically and uh, high caliber athletics, uh, where his use started to turn to dependency and then I think more towards addiction, how he was able to manage both his academics and playing uh, college sports while shooting up. He then told me about the uh, nights relatively near graduation where uh, he decided he didn't care whether he lived or died. And the next day, he made the decision that he wanted to get clean, and he locked himself in a hotel room uh, for eight days. And he described to me the experience of going between what he described sort of a state of being alive and not alive and the incredible pain that he went through. <coughs> and then he told me of his um, sort of the unlikely sobriety that came about after that. Uh, because that's not a, a common story that you hear from someone in recovery. And I, when I think about him, I think about, I'm just so grateful that he had enough days where he could get to the place where he could make the decision to be clean, uh, where he had enough experiences that, that he, enough experiences he survived through so that he and I could be having that discussion. And that, to me, is the, would be the promise of a safe injection site. And uh, he, of course, was in the era uh, that was a little bit more pre-fentanyl. So it was a, different, a little bit of a different time. On the other hand, um, I think about a senior at my high school who I've been working closely, closely with for the past three years. And when I think about her, I want to draw the hardest line I can possibly draw and have our uh, society and never condone heroin use because of the neglect that we see in our kids, that they experience when their parents are using. And I can't possibly imagine how a safe injection site um, would help prevent that neglect. She, uh, two days ago, handed in her senior project to me, and she decided to study the uh, opioid epidemic. And I'm just going to 
to use some of her words, it's odd timing that I'm speaking tonight since she just handed this paper in to me. It's going to read you a little bit of her introduction and a little bit of her conclusion. What happened to my sister broke me. In the United States alone, there are roughly 91 Americans who die from opioid-related causes every day, a total of 32,000 people a year. Unfortunately, my sister Hope became a part of that statistic. She died when I was 13 due to my mother's addiction to opioid drugs. Ever since that tragedy, I've been trying to figure out the big question, why? Why do people turn to drugs? Why can't we seem to stop addiction? Why would someone use drugs knowing they could die? What can I do? Why didn't my sister get a fair chance to live? When I first heard about Graduation Challenge, I instantly thought of digging deeper into these questions that had plagued me for a long time, attempting to understand our country's rising opioid epidemic. So her paper goes on to share some of her learnings from the year. And when she wraps up her paper, she says, as I finished the project, I thought I would be able to forgive my mom. Strangely, I was almost angrier because now I know why. Now I know how much treatment and help there is out there. I know now that an addict doesn't start out as an addict. I definitely understand more of why my childhood with my mother was taken from me and my siblings, and I know why things happened the way they were. But I also feel like she had a choice. I feel like she could have gotten help and admitted she was an addict. But because she didn't, I'm not going to be able to share my life with the sister I was supposed to. There's no way this epidemic we are having is just going to one day disappear. I know I can't myself just make this problem go away. But I know I can help. I know I can tell people the dangers of drugs. I can tell my friends and family and anyone else that I need to. I can create something where people can go to talk and get help. And that's my plan for my tangible product. It's to create a site where anyone who knows of someone who is struggling with addiction can go or get themselves help. Because no one can face addiction alone. I want to name the site after my sister so her name is out there. It's not just a name. It's something that's needed to get by. Help. So when I think about the issues that we struggle with in a high school, the obvious issues aren't the ones we're always dealing with. Overdoses from ages 14 to 18 certainly happen, but it's the more nuanced trauma that we deal with. It's what happens with kids who grow up ages zero to three even, who experience the neglect where they have trouble forming healthy relationships. And seeing that play out in a person's life, uh, there's always incredible hope. I mean, I see as much resilience as we, as we, see, um, as we see in pain. Uh, but to me, I, I don't know. I, when I, the, the more I think about it, the less, the less that I, I would feel comfortable um, supporting safe injection sites as opposed to uh, putting some of our resources in others, other forms of harm reduction. So I'm going to leave it at that and, uh, and hand the mic over. Adam, thanks, and thanks for bringing the voices of some of your students to this because you know, it's, it's uh, worth noting that the panel is full of a lot of esteemed leaders in our community. And you know, we're, we're talking about people, but certainly people who are experiencing addiction and experiencing what happens with addiction are equally important in this conversation. So I appreciate you bringing some of their voices. Uh, Brandon Del Pozo, you're next. Thank you. Um, so earlier today, I was, I was in a room um, at a community staff meeting with uh, it seemingly like half the people in this room. <laughs> I, I said that we should all travel around on a school bus talking about this constantly, uh, or just like a nine passenger van. The state could probably save a lot of money if it just partnered with the city and, and um, you know, went everywhere all at once. Yeah. Um, so, but that, that, just, that does illustrate the point that there's a lot of men and women here uh, working together. Uh, despite variations in opinion, I, I do agree with the commissioner that every person on this panel and so many people I see in the audience have a, a shared uh, desire to, to see folks through this crisis. Um, I also think what the commissioner said was, was a good profound segue into uh, some of the points that I'd like to make, which is the question of not did anyone die in a um, uh, safe injection site, 
but how many people nonetheless died even if uh, they used a safe injection site or even with one in town? Because um, that's a harm reduction question, right? The model of harm reduction is how much exposure to morbidity and mortality can we capture and neutralize in order to lower its rate at the population level. Uh, and I think that that's the, the commitment that the city is making in our approach is to look for a uh, population level way to lower uh, the mortality caused by the, um, the opioid crisis. Another way to think of it is that every day that somebody is addicted to uh, or has opioid use disorder, um, they, they have an exposure to, to mortality. So how many person risk days can you capture uh, and neutralize? And so it becomes a question of where do we prioritize safe injection among uh, other interventions that also reduce mortality. The best intervention that science says and is unequivocal about is uh, medicine, right? If you really, really, really want to uh, radically reduce mortality, you just put buprenorphine in the drinking water and overnight uh, you'd see a profound reduction in mortality. And I make that, you know, I say that lightheartedly to capture your attention, but I really think that that the science is clear that the number one thing for reducing mortality in the opioid crisis is number one, buprenorphine, and the number two, methadone. Uh, that's a settled matter, uh, in my mind anyway, having read the research, if folks feel differently, uh, that's a point of, of discussion. But then we have to see if that is the, the most effective means, how do we get it out there, and then where does safe injection fall in uh, relative to that, and, and is it cost effective to pursue one or both or to make a choice. So uh, it's interesting that Vancouver has a site because Vancouver's population uh, is very similar to Vermont's. They have 631,000 people. We have about 620. We estimate, uh, and by the way, with the numbers here, I put in really tiny print at the bottom in your packet where I got the information from. It's from Verm uh, Vancouver's safe injection facility itself. Um, as far as the other stuff, I'll try to make explicit where the, where the data is coming from. But um, we estimate there's about plus or minus uh, 18,000 active people suffering from opioid use disorder not in treatment in Vermont. And I have to say, when you look at my numbers, if I've had to make an estimate, I've tried to make it charitable towards safe injection. Uh, and even if there's an error, we're talking about a factor of one or two, not, not 10 or 20. Um, so we have about 620,000 people with about 18,000 active um, users. We had 136 overdose deaths total from all sources in 2016. Uh, this year in 2017, about 101 or 102 just from opioids. Vancouver, for its part, had 30, 335 overdose deaths uh, in 2017. What that says to me is that their prevalence rate's more acute. They probably have more than 18,000 people uh, mm. using, but we'll just assume they're like Vermont. Uh, they report that their safe injection facility had 175,000 visits by 7,301 uh, unique individuals. That's to consume all types of things, not only to inject, but to consume all types of drugs. Um, so if that were Vermont, that would mean that about 40% of the users uh, in the state, by way of, of comparison, would be registered to use the site, a little less than half. Um, that would mean, however, that these individual users were going to the safe injection facility about once every 24 days, just as an average. Um, some would go more, some would go less. But let's assume for a second that the day you cross the threshold of the site, you're immune from dying. Nothing you can, you can, you know, drink a gallon of fentanyl and, and, and you visited the site, you're going to live. We know that people inject more than once a day. We know that they skip days. But let's say that every day you're not at the site, you're in danger. Breaking the threshold makes you immune. If that were the case, and Vermont's prevalence were to prevail in Vancouver, that the site would capture, in that case, 4.2% of the risk for the registered users. But that would mean only 1.7% of the total risk for Vancouverites. So um, you know, based on these assumptions, and we can question the model, we're saying that the safe injection facility, based on, on their visit data, captures 2% of Vancouver's fatal risk. In 2017, just looking at injections specifically, they had 415 injection room visits per day. That's times 365, 151,000 injection room visits per year. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, if people inject once a day, which is, is not the average, but let's just assume it is, it's charitable towards the site, then they would inject 6.6 uh, .6 million times a year in Vancouver. That's 2.3, the, the injection facility would capture 2.3% of the, uh, the total injections. So um, again, what I'm trying to stress is that, that it's having, if it's about capturing risk, this is uh, you know, to go to war with the US attorney uh, for the state of, of Vermont, 
um, for 2.3% of the risk. I just think that's a conscious decision we'd have to make and how it ranks with other interventions. Um, I'll just have a few other, other facts and then I'll, I'll turn it over. Um, in 2017, they reported 2,151 overdose interventions at the site. Now, I'm sure they have a very, the fact that no one has ever died there means they have a very conservative uh, overdose intervention protocol. They don't want to risk it. They're going to intervene whenever they need to to make sure someone doesn't uh, perish. That means that they're intervening in 1.4% of all the in injections or consumptions that happen there. So about 1.5% of the time, they see a case where they need to intervene. If that rate prevails throughout the rest of Vancouver, then there were 90,000 unsupervised interventions uh, in Vancouver. Those 90,000 unsupervised interventions resulted in 335 observed deaths in Vancouver. That means that less than one half of 1% of all consumptions, uh, of all overdoses, not, 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 excuse me, uh, less than a half, about, let's say, a half a percent of all overdoses ultimately prove fatal uh, in Vancouver. And if you think about it, that's the case. Some people have signs of overdose, decreased respiration, prolonged unconsciousness, uh, and they come out of it. Um, what that would indicate, it's a last bit of math, I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, I, it's because I did the slides at the last minute, not because I'm trying to do a sleight of hand. But what, what this would suggest, if you take that number and then carry it back into the facility, the death rate uh, that prevailed on the street versus the use rate on the street, that the site would have saved somewhere between uh, eight and 10 lives, um, which compared to a base of 335 is, is capturing a very small amount of the death. If we scale that back to Chittenden County, uh, it would assume that a, a site here might save one to three lives a year um, versus the 30 odd folks that perished in the, in the county last year. And also what this doesn't get to is that 61% of Vermont is rural and we don't know of uh, an effective safe consumption model for rural communities. It just doesn't, uh, there's no model where that's worked. So this is a site that, that would not work as a model for more than half of Vermont. Now, when folks say three lives are worth it or eight lives are worth it, I say absolutely saving any amount of lives uh, are worth it. Um, but when you're a public health interventionist, you have to be somewhat agnostic about the point at which you save the lives. You have to acknowledge that saving the lives are what matter. So the question is, we might be losing the opportunity to save lives in a safe injection facility, but if we can, if we can save those lives in a prison setting or uh, by putting people on buprenorphine while they're on a wait list um, or by intervening at the emergency department with buprenorphine or by some other way, uh, from a public health perspective, that is just as valuable as saving eight lives in an injection facility. And I'm going to argue that we could save even more with other types of interventions. So I just urge that as we have this debate that takes up a lot of interest in oxygen, that we prioritize this intervention versus other interventions. Thanks, Chief Del Pozo. Dr. Fisher. That was a lot of, a lot of data for a, for for a, a cop, police officer. For a policeman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed, Chief. A lot of math, too. It's just division. It was hard to keep up with you. Uh, so I've been practicing medicine in Vermont for about 15 years. I spent uh, 10 years at the community health centers in Burlington, and then about five years at a, as a hospitalist at UVM Medical Center, and in the last three weeks as, a, uh, as the new chief medical officer at Central Vermont uh, Medical Center in Berlin. Um, and I, I've seen this effect of the opiate crisis a lot, and, and medical providers such as myself are faced with the challenge of addressing complica complications from opiate use disorders and associated injection drug use. IV drug use, as, as we know, has reached epidemic proportions in the United States. We are seeing more and more people dependent on opiates, um, abusing opioids, and switching to IV opioids, including heroin and fentanyl and then suffering consequences of IV opioid use, including serious infection and death. Unsafe injection practices among people who inject drugs can lead to complications requiring acute care encounters in doctor's offices, emergency departments, and in the hospital. Serious infections, including um, infections of the bloodstream, heart valves, bones, spinal canal, and skin, are a recognized complication of IV drug use and a major cause of illness and death in people who inject drugs. IV drug use has also dramatically increases an individual's risk of acquiring chronic infections such as hepatitis C and HIV. Hospitalizations related to opioid abuse both with and without associated serious infections continue to increase. In 2012, inpatient hospital charges in the U.S. reached 15 billion for hospitalizations due to opioid abuse and dependence and 700 million 
for hospitalizations related to associated infections. The prim primary payer for this care is Medicaid. Last year, I was invited to, to join State Attorney Sarah George's Safe Injection Site Commission. I was initially opposed to the concept of safe injection sites. How I thought could a healthcare professional, someone grounded in ethics and an oath to do no harm, stand by and watch as people injected drugs into their veins? I wondered if such facilities would just enable IV drug use. I also questioned if it wouldn't be better just to offer people tre treatment for their addictions. But I see the opioid crisis expanding at still an alarming rate, and I see people with addictions who aren't ready or able to stop using drugs. I've taken care of a 26-year-old young man admitted to the hospital in heart failure as a result of injecting drugs <coughs> whose only path to survival was a um, heart valve replacement and sobriety. I cared for a 23-year-old pregnant woman admitted with septic emboli, or clots, all over her body, including in the placenta, which was feeding the baby, as a result of heart valve vegetations from IV drug use. I also admitted to the hospital a 19-year-old who had lost vision in his right eye due to, admit, uh, due to injecting drugs into his face. I cared for all three of these patients the same week this, this past winter. The consequences of IV drug use, particularly those who use unsafe injection techniques, including not cleaning their skin properly, sharing needles, syringe reuse, and improper disposal, can be catastrophic. So on Sarah's George's commission, I became curious about safe injection sites and their philosophy of true harm reduction and for those most vulnerable members of our communities and I started to research what others know about them. It turns out that such facilities do reduce harm. Safe injection facilities have been established in Canada, Australia, and Europe, and have been associated with lower levels of drug injections occurring publicly, safer syringe disposal, and reduced overdose death rates. Since Insight in Vancouver opened their doors in 2003, they've reported a 35% reduction in deaths related to overdose and a 30% increase in their users entering treatment for opiate use disorders. They've also shown a reduction in bloodstream-related infections, a reduction in HIV and hepatitis C risk behavior, a reduction in the incidence of needles found in parks and other areas around the community, and a reduction in people injecting in public areas, including parks and vehicles. One visit to a safe injection site by a user can lead to safer injection techniques, even when injecting outside the facility. 129 individuals die unintentionally every day in our country from the consequences of IV drug use. And despite all the time and money that we've invested in this epidemic, epidemic, the deaths keep mounting. The cruel reality of opiate addiction is that any episode of use can be immediately fatal. Even when recovery is the goal, the path to it is often circuitous, and the most people with addiction have occurrences along the way, reoccurrences along the way the odds of dying before reaching the goal are tragically high. Are we enabling drug users with this type of facility? If the current epidemic can teach us anything, it's that drug use is soaring unassisted. In conjunction with prevention, including education to youth about the risks of opioids and IV drug use, reduced opiate prescribing, and increased access to treatment for people with opiate use disorders, safe injection facilities may be one way to meet people where they're at and may just enable them to stay alive long enough to get into treatment and recovery. Supervised inje injection facilities have been proven to save lives, improve health, increase neighborhood safety, reduce costs, and ultimately increase engagement in treatment. I think they're an important step in recognizing that people who use drugs have not forfeited their human rights, including the right for safety and health. Go ahead. Now that I talked about you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Fisher. Sarah George. Thank you. Um, so again, my name is Sarah George. I'm the Chittenden County State's Attorney. And um, I was appointed last January to this position. But before that, I was a prosecutor in the same office for six years. Um, as a prosecutor, uh, our office responds to every untimely death in the county. And when I first started as a prosecutor seven years ago, um, I, I learned of that task that we were required to do in the first couple of weeks on the job, which they certainly don't teach you in law school. And I expected that that meant some suicides, um, some elderly people dying in their sleep, heart attacks, that sort of thing. What I was extremely surprised to find was going to homes on a regular basis for fatal overdoses on heroin. 
and being the individual in the room comforting parents and families after they lose somebody um, in a lot of cases where those families didn't even know that their loved one was using. And uh, some of those individuals were familiar to law enforcement or familiar to me as a prosecutor, but I think what gets lost in this discussion is that most of them are not. Um, many of them were middle and upper class families with kids that were using or parents using, where those individuals were too ashamed to tell their family members um, to seek treatment, and um, most of them had started their addiction on a valid pain prescription. Um, but for me, one day, I'd gone to many of those um, instances, but one day after I had been appointed, um, I got a call for an untimely overdose. So I responded, I went to the home, and it was a 24-year-old girl who was um, deceased in her room of her parents' home, middle class family. Um, her had a she had a good job. She was in a great relationship, um, good parents, and her parents again didn't know that she'd been using. Uh, her fiance had known that she had been given a prescription and that she was abusing it, but had no idea that she had started injecting, and. She had the valid prescription from a soccer injury in college, and she'd had to have a surgery. And in that moment, I saw myself in her. She was 24. Um, I was a soccer player. I played in college. I had many injuries. I was offered many pain prescriptions, but luckily, I don't react well to them, and so I never took them. But it was the first time in my job that I really saw myself in one of those fatalities, and I saw my parents and her parents, and I saw my partner and her fiance. And it, it struck me that that's what public officials need, unfortunately. And I think too often we need to see ourselves or someone that we really love in that position before we really start to think about what we're going to do to address it. And you know, I think that we talk a lot about public health and public safety and harm reduction and substance use disorder as a disease, but we don't truly react to it in that way. And that's, for me, as state's attorney, why I started this commission and why I am pushing um, for the legislation for safe injection sites, because I really do see this as a public health and a public safety issue for the individuals <clears throat> in the community, not only that are using intravenous drugs, but for those of us that aren't, and are coming across discarded needles um, or are coming across people in the public restrooms who are using, or for myself, responding to homes and seeing somebody deceased by themselves because they didn't have a safe place to go to use. Um, but I want to just address a few of the common concerns that have come up and do come up. And one of them is the enabling, which Dr. Fisher touched on. Um, I think the research is very clear that they do not enable drug use. If anything, they enable safety and safe practices and safe injection. Um, anyone that would use a facility is already injecting drugs, and they're doing it likely in an unsafe manner and by themselves. Or they're using it with somebody else who's also using. Um, there's enormous evidence to show that you know when you're criminalized for your drug use behavior or there's stigma attached to it, it drives you away from the services that are designed to help you. And I think that's exactly what we're dealing with in this, in this crisis, is people that don't feel like they can go because there's too much stigma, stigma attached to it. So if you remove the fear of stigma and legal consequences to the use um, it makes those people easier to access the treatment that um, they need. And as to the costs, you know, frankly for me, focusing on the cost as a primary deterrent feels somewhat immoral um, because, you know, you're literally attempting to put a, a number value on somebody's life. And, you know, if we take, if we take the chief's um, position that it might save eight to ten lives, um, like Tom, why don't, from Tom to Ed, if you guys stand up, I think you're nine. <laughs> you too, Scott, all of you guys. 
All right, so this is nine. How many people in this room know somebody in this nine people? Great. So is there anybody in this room that's comfortable saying that one of their lives is worth a certain amount? $10,000? Go ahead, you can sit down. I just, I mean, that's really what we're asking, what you're asking us to do in order to support it. I need to know how much money is going to be spent on it. And I just think that that's, that's really not the place we should be coming from. We need to decide if as a community we're comfortable with this as a potential option, and then we'll figure the money out. And I don't mean that to say that the money doesn't matter. It, it does. But I think an even more important aspect to take into account is the money saved. And that gets really ignored, I think, far too often. Um, you know, the, it's important to think about the cost that you'd save in incarceration costs or other supervision costs, healthcare costs. Um, and as to healthcare costs, as, as Dr. Fisher said, you know, they encourage safe injection techniques, they promote overdose prevention, they improve access to primary care. Um, they increase access to substance use treatment, and as a result, they reduce the incidence of serious infections and resulting hospitalizations, reduce the transmission of chronic infections like hepatitis C and HIV, and they reduce the mortality in people who do inject drugs. And, you know, we've heard the numbers on how much UVM Medical Center is spending every year in endocarditis surgeries, blood infections, and like she said, that's Medicaid is paying for that. Um, and it is millions of dollars, if not more. Um, you know, those are the numbers we should be talking about. Not the number we're, we're comfortable with putting on someone's life, but the number that we could save and get back in taxpayer money. And, you know, again, to the, the, to the chief's point, I want to stress that I have never and will never say that safe injection sites are the answer. Um, they are not going to solve the problem solve the problem. Um, they will not prevent all risky drug use or save every life. There's no doubt about it, and I don't think anybody that supports them would ever say that. Um, but they are absolutely part of the wider framework that we need to be looking at for true harm reduction. Um, there really, I don't believe, is a better form of harm reduction. If you think about that term in very pure terms, it is the only thing that while somebody is actively using and injecting, reduces their harm and their, their risk of dying at the time. Um, to, you know, to the argument that we should be focusing on treatment and assuring that it is truly on demand, I completely agree. I absolutely think that we need to be doing that. I think that should be a priority for us. Um, but it ignores the fact that there's people in this community who are not at that place yet. And they are not ready for treatment. And that does not mean they are any less our problem. They are not any less our people. They are our community. They matter. And to say that, they, that people that are ready for treatment should be treated differently, the people that are in treatment are not dying. Um, the people that are on MAT or, or on buprenorphine, they are not dying. It's the people that are not there yet and are currently needing our help. Um, they're still a member of our community and our state, and they're someone's daughter, they're someone's mother, sister, brother. Uh, they still need us, um, and arguably they need us more. You know, I, um, you know, as, as Scott has said, you must be alive to begin recovery, and I think that we have an obligation to keep people alive as long as we can until they can get into recovery. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Grace Keller. Hi. Um, I'm Grace Keller. I'm the program coordinator at Howard Center Safe Recovery. Safe Recovery is a program of the Howard Center that was started in 2000. We are Vermont's oldest and largest syringe exchange, in addition to being the first and largest community-based Narcan distribution site. We served over 1,300 Vermonters last year. We are a statewide program as 34% of our clients come from outside of Chittenden County, and we have clients that come from every county in the state. We're a professionally staffed recovery center for people who are addicted to heroin or other pain medications. As Vermont's largest community-based Narcan distribution site, we distribute over 70% of Vermont's overdose rescue kits. 
I am proud to say that we have handed out over 18,000 doses of Narcan and have had 1,147 people come back to tell us that they've used it to reverse an overdose and save a life. <clears throat> we have also trained over 1,000 providers in the community from schools, colleges, homeless and battered women's shelters, drug treatment centers, housing authorities, recovery centers, and law enforcement. This makes it more likely that in the event of an overdose, someone present will have Narcan and will know how to respond. But Vermont is in a fentanyl crisis. We have lost more clients to fatal overdose in the last year than in the 16 years that we have been operating prior to that combined. We used to go over a year without losing a client, and recently we are losing multiple clients a month. It is devastating. So when Sarah George asked me to be on the Safe Injection Commission, I was intrigued. I had done a lot of research on the topic, but had not put it in context of Vermont. The group came together with a shared sense of urgency, and I felt like I owed it to the people who have died, their loved ones, and the people who are currently at risk to consider all options. My first order of business was to find out what our clients thought about safe consumption sites. Was it something they felt would be helpful? Would they use it? I knew that some of them would say yes. What I didn't know is that it would be over 90%. I also knew that a lot of our clients are high risk for overdose and many other drug-related harms, but the new survey was astounding even to me. Historically, we ask our clients on intake how many of them have witnessed in someone else's overdose. Every year, it typically oscillates between 23 and 26%. Last year, it was 26%. On this survey, 81% of them had witnessed an overdose. This is fentanyl. They went further to report that 57% of them had experienced an overdose, 75% of them had used a loan, 65% of them had used in a car, 56% of them had used in a public restroom, 53% had used in a public place, 67% had an abscess or other drug-related infection, 56% have had emergency room visits due to drug-related complications, and 46% had a drug-related hospitalization one day or more. The secret to syringe exchange that anyone who spends a couple of minutes there will see is that it is a strong and natural conduit to treatment. Safe recovery is recovery-focused. It is in our name. The best way to prevent overdose is to get clients into treatment. Every client gets offered a linkage to treatment and a Narcan kit every time they come through our doors. We are very successful as we link more people to medication-assisted treatment than any other program. In 2017, we connected 228 people to treatment through the hub and spoke system. Narcan is also a natural conduit to treatment. In the first year, over 90% of the people trained on Narcan <coughs> accepted a treatment <coughs> referral in the same session. What the drug treatment community knows is that the decision to seek treatment is a quick and fleeting moment. Our focus is to capitalize on that moment and give people the support to act on it in real time. In our voluntary case management program, historically over 96% of our case managed clients access treatment that year. When you are ready, we are there. Recently, I toured Insight, Vancouver's safe consumption site, and saw the advantages of their frontline workers have firsthand. They have millions of injections and thousands of overdoses, but they have never had one fatality. Even with the fentanyl and carfentanyl crisis, they have remained 100% protective against overdose death. In fact, there are over 100 safe injection or consumption sites in the world, and there has never been a fatality in any one of them. The safe consumption site has benefits like medical staff and oxygen, but their biggest advantage is time. When an overdose occurs at a safe consumption site, they can respond immediately. At Safe Recovery, we have revived 15 people with Narcan, all of whom were brought to our office overdosing and not breathing. When this happens, we have no idea how long they, the person has been in that state. Each time, we have been able to revive the person, but it is my biggest fear that someday we will not be so lucky and my entire staff might witness someone die. The last person who overdosed was a 19-year-old girl. She was half my age. She could have been my daughter. She was not breathing. She was blue. I administered four doses of Narcan and did rescue breathing, and she regained consciousness only when the ambulance got there and the EMTs took over. Another do overdose was a client I knew. He was a young man in his early 20s. I gave him four doses of Narcan and nine minutes of mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. He was blue and not responding, and I was sure that he was going to die. 
The whole time I was breathing for him, his dog was in the car, jumping at my face and coming close to biting me because he thought I was hurting him. His friend who brought him to our office was screaming and crying and begging for him to live. When he woke up, the first thing he did was ask for help. I made a call to the clinic and got him into treatment the next day. We need a professional there for these captive moments. When people overdose, they are often terrified and want treatment immediately. We don't want to miss that moment. After I've revived someone from an overdose, my first thought is, I am so thankful that they are alive. Almost immediately following is, what can we do differently? Another way that safe recovery loses clients is to endocarditis. Endocarditis is an infection of the heart valve. Endocarditis cases are growing exponentially. In 2013, UVM, saw, UVM Medical Center saw nine cases of drug-related endocarditis. And in 2017, the number had risen to 59. Endocarditis can require heart valve replacement surgery in what typically are otherwise young, healthy people. If they survive, they have a serious heart condition for life that will probably shorten their lifespan. It also requires weeks to months in the hospital and costs between $100,000 and $600,000 per case. These cases are the results of not having sterile supplies, access to clean water, or a sterile environment. 85% of our clients have experienced homelessness in their lifetime, so they are higher risk for endocarditis. Fatal, and endo fatal overdose and endocarditis are on the rise, and human trafficking is on the rise, and many other drug-related harms are destroying the lives of Vermonters. Safe recovery is on the front lines of all of this. As with anything, we need to arm our frontline workers with the best tools and what science tells us works. And most importantly, when seconds count, time. At the end of the commission, we arrived at the same place with law enforcement, people in recovery, and medical professionals in supporting a legislative path forward that includes wraparound services. Clients are asking for it, their families are asking for it, and people in recovery wish they had it available to them when they needed it. That being said, there is a lot to think about. And at Safe Recovery, we have an incredibly high standard when it comes to safety and best practices. We understand that further study and evaluation would be required along with the legislature's approval to establish safe injection in Vermont. When you're one giving mouth to mouth or attending a funeral or telling someone they have HIV and research tells you there's an option that is evidence-based, you feel you have to consider it. When a client dies, I know that person. I know their dreams and aspirations. I know their recovery goals, and I know their recovery successes. Oftentimes, I know their children, their partners, and parents that are left behind. It is in the moments before I go to sleep, I think of these people and the tremendous loss, and I think, what can we do differently, and that we have to do better. We owe it to these clients and the people that love them and the people who are currently at risk to have these conversations and to study all the options. Syringe exchange workers know all too well the worry we feel when clients leave the building. It is time to consider keeping them closer to us. The current laws drive people into hiding. They use alone and in cars and in desolate areas. 90% of them say they want a more responsible option. It is time to consider bringing them into a medical setting to people who care about them, who can connect them to treatment and potentially save their life. Thanks, Grace. <clears throat> and Dr. Levine. Can I break with tradition and come up there? Yeah, come right up. <laughs> Can I sit over there? It's just, yeah, it's just easier to try these slides. <clears throat> and I won't have to keep saying next slide. Thank you all for coming and having such an interest in this topic, and thanks for inviting me. Um, so I just passed the one-year anniversary for being health commissioner. And needless to say, this issue, not this issue, but the issue of the opioid crisis has been front and center for a very long time. Um, and every day goes by, and it's always on the menu, so to speak. Um, I have an over 25-year practice history of internal medicine in the community. I have had patients who have died from this epidemic. Never are they elderly. They are always in the prime of life. And I've had numerous older adults who I care for who have stories to tell about their interaction with the crisis itself or sometimes the loss they've had because of it. <clears throat> so I have plenty of compassion, but this is going to be a bit of a dispassionate presentation. My goal is really not to take a strong, passionate position one way or the other, but to provide some information and facts 
and ask some questions and allow you to come to some sense that may be based uh, at least on some evidence, if possible. <clears throat> a lot of my predecessors have actually presented more data than I'm going to present. That's usually my role. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to present more uh, facts and somewhat restrictive in that because of the time constraints. But if you remember nothing else, it's that I do take this seriously. And anything that could <clears throat> potentially save a life in Vermont, I have to pay attention to. Um, to make a wise decision, though, I need to sort of understand the evidence base. I want to thank members of my uh, alcohol and drug abuse program division in the Department of Health for helping with some of the literature review, and there is voluminous literature. Um, and um, when we have evidence base, we talk about evidence base, we talk about how valid the studies are for the problem they're addressing. So can you trust the data they present? But we also talk about, is it generalizable? So I'm going to focus a little bit on both. Uh, we need to be able to really compare alternative strategies. We need to factor in Vermont versus Vancouver, for instance. And we need to be responsible stewards of our dollars, though I agree with Sarah George that that can't be our driving theme. <clears throat> this is the data I'm going to present, and it just shows the overdose death rate from opioids, unintentional death rate in Vermont. So uh, everyone was alarmed a year ago when we had a 30% increase in that rate. Most recently, we've gone from 96 to 101 deaths, which was 5% increase rate. Notice in the right-hand column that fentanyl is playing a larger and larger role. So I don't have a story or two or three from my practice to tell you. I, I really think I have 101 stories. And if you do the math, every week, two Vermonters are dying from an unintentional opioid overdose. Anything that could help that, <clears throat> we should think about seriously. And this just gives you the picture of that. So if you look at the literature, these have been around for 30 years. A lot of them began in Europe, but there's hardly any information from Europe on them. Much more information from Australia and from British Columbia or Vancouver. Uh, but the common themes about what these things can do, <clears throat> SIFs or SISs, whatever you want to call them, they can limit the adverse consequences of intravenous drug use, needless to say, one of which is overdose death. <clears throat> they are great educators of all the harms that we hope to reduce. They provide access to medical services because there are lots of problems that come with injecting drugs into yourself, whether it be skin abscesses, whether it be endocarditis, or what have you. Um, and your life falls apart, as many people who are in the audience and have connections with others know, um, people don't care for themselves the way they could because they're preoccupied with only one thing, and that is alleviating the craving. And then ready referral to treatment uh, is always uh, a pathway, though not reported as well as we'd like to see it. <clears throat> when I say probably valid conclusions, um, that means probably valid, um, but a little challenging to tell. And why challenging? <clears throat> because a lot of the literature is purely from the Vancouver uh, Insight uh, location uh, and their experience, um, and it's not necessarily from abundant places around the world. We know that this might be a great way to prevent the transmission of viral diseases like hepatitis C and HIV. But look how many people have that on the way in. Um, it's hard to show a reduction if your population has already got very high rates of some of these conditions, specifically hep C. Um, I agree with everyone that says that the overdose death rate at the sites is zero. Um, and clearly, there are decreased overdose deaths in the local areas. But Vancouver, um, if you look at the map, which I'll show you, these sites still have the highest death rates in that particular area of town. There are favorable impacts on the local environment, not as many needles or syringes uh, being disposed of, not as much public use of drugs in full view of little kids or anyone else. And the crime statistics actually don't show that 
things are worsening, not necessarily improving, but certainly no worsening in crime. <clears throat> in this little map, there's a red circle around uh, part of Vancouver. That's where the uh, couple of treatment facilities are, the self-injection sites. Um, and they, through the years, continue to remain the highest locations for overdose death rate in Vancouver. Um, so people aren't dying in their building, but in the local area, there's still a significant problem. Concerns about the literature, obviously it's not ethical to do a controlled study, uh, but there's not a lot of information even on comparison groups using other strategies besides uh, an injection facility. Um, you heard from some of the speakers already about the concern that they'd love to see some data about long-term outcomes in terms of getting into treatment, remaining in treatment, having a productive life in recovery. And then issues around generalizability. Um, the Massachusetts Medical Society took a very serious look at this because there was interest in the uh, state of Massachusetts about this, and they were very concerned and had a whole task force addressing the issue of legal liability, and basically said they couldn't even go near this until they knew the risk of legal liability was diminished enough by legislation that would occur that would keep them safe. There's also not just legal liability, but professional liability for the healthcare providers that are in these sites, whether they be physicians, nurse practitioners, et cetera. Um, generalizability to uh, geography, um, the chief talked about a little bit. Um, there are 5,000 people who inject drugs in a 10 block radius in Vancouver. And we clearly don't have that in Vermont. If we did this, it would have to almost be city by city um, because you'd hate to think about what happened on a winter night if somebody went to a facility, did their injection, was released at a time that it was thought to be safe, and then drove home uh, uh, to a rural part of Vermont. The other part is the data the chief was presenting about the number of people um, in every 24 days, what have you. I think the goal that most of the panel has been presenting is if you went to one of these sites, this would be your home away from home because we know you're not taking days off from the use of opioids. And most of the time, you want to be safe every injection because every injection represents an opportunity to have a fatal overdose. So in theory, if you lived close and used the site, um, regularly, you would be uh, keeping yourself as safe as possible. <laughs> the dilemma of injection assistance, uh, data that I was surprised to see was a fair proportion, a quarter, maybe a third of people actually going to the Vancouver site were people who actually required assistance to uh, get their injection. Um, so they had people obviously outside of that site who were helping them do that. Uh, how would providers of health care feel about uh, that model where they would be assisting in the injection, not just trying to keep people safe after they injected? <coughs> Standardization of drug formulation, fentanyl, Grace has said a tremendous amount about uh, the, the crisis we have with fentanyl. Um, we also know that in Vancouver, there's a one single site that allows a special pharmaceutical grade, if you will, heroin that they will uh, provide for the client. I don't see that happening here in this uh, region or, or country at this time, but that is something that would be poorly generalizable. <laughs> and then lastly, it's, it is a harm reduction strategy. We have to call it what it is. Um, so how does it compare to other harm reduction strategies? You know, the prime ones we have in Vermont now are pretty much universal access to naloxone and use of facilities like safe recovery that allows syringe exchange and a whole host of other benefits that come with that human interaction every time the person shows up at the door. Uh, not just being resuscitated if they overdose, but more importantly, having the conversations about all the things they can do to keep themselves safe and perhaps uh, when they're ready, enter into treatment. And then we've 
bent the curve a little on the overdose death rate, as you saw, from a 30% a year ago to 5%. We'll see what happens in the future. Uh, but is something already happening that's going to reduce the number of overdose deaths even further? Whether it be the new prescriber rules for clinicians, the use of the prescription monitoring systems, anything, the fact that we now have complete access to treatment, people don't have to go on a lengthy waiting list, they can go to one of our hubs and pretty much know what their plan is in a very short window of time. Um, initiatives like buprenorphine in an emergency room or other settings, all of these things are happening concurrently. And some might say we should just do them all. And in some sense, I believe in that. Uh, but some are more expensive than others, and we just have to be cognizant of good stewards of uh, dollars that we have. Um, so that's sort of my uh, presentation. Um, I certainly haven't taken it off the menu. I'm not representing uh, the health department's view. The health department has an official neutral view. The state of Vermont, I, uh, to my recollection, has no view, you know, if you look at state government. Um, and I've tried to provide a balanced uh, presentation of the things we need to think about uh, knowing that we should think about everything that could save a life, but that's evaluated on the merits that we know we have in the literature. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, I want to acknowledge two things before we open this up to questions and comments. And the first is, it is not going to feel like we have enough time for questions. I, I guarantee it. Um, and especially with seven panelists, it's not going to be possible for all seven panelists to answer each question either. So I just want to acknowledge that this may feel incomplete, but we, I think, can agree that we're all probably going to go back to our homes, to our families, to our friends, and have more of this conversation. And that's part of the goal of tonight, not necessarily to come to one unified conclusion. I also just want to state what is probably obvious, but to acknowledge that, you know, I've been watching all of you, and I can see the nods of understanding, and in some cases, the anguish on your face, that this is a, a reality that uh, many of you have lived through or are living through. And I just want to take a moment to say this is, this is hard, it's emotional, and it's OK to be emotional. I'm emotional. <laughs> so that being said, let's open it up to questions. Oh, thanks. Uh, first, my views do not necessarily represent those of my organization. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Anderson, you, you talked about the stigmatization uh, that, we, that it surrounds tobacco use, um, and rightly so, I think, in this country, in this state, um, uh, about how you know, we don't want our youth to use it, and I, I absolutely agree. Um, in this state, we also celebrate alcohol use. We past we tout Vermont beer and Vermont cider and all these other things. We talk about, you know, how great it is. We want to bring more young people to Vermont. Um, but isn't that also dangerous to our youth? Isn't that also something that we should be talking about? So I, I am, I'm wondering where the, where is the line here? I mean, is it, is it something that, you know, as long as this, ec is, this isn't economically profitable for the state, it's okay to not like it? I guess I have a trouble following your how this is relates to safe injection sites. Isn't a bar a safe drinking uh, site? Well, it's because you talk about how you don't want we don't want our youth to use tobacco, correct? We don't want anybody to use tobacco. Right, but you talk specifically about our youth and how we talk about that. Okay, so and you talked about how safe injection sites could send the wrong message to our youth and there should be the same stigmatization around drug use. But we don't seem to have that same stigmatization around alcohol use. So I'm wondering where the line is here. I think my point was we, we, tobacco is a substance that kills. It kills a lot of Vermonters. It kills a lot of Americans. We stigmatize its use. We prevent its use. We stop its use. We try to discourage its use. And I, I think my point was should a dangerous drug like uh, opioids, should we, should we have the same unacceptance of that as we do with tobacco? I, I, I think that was my point. Uh, the issue with respect to alcohol, obviously those are policy decisions that have been made by the state over many, many, many years as to, you know, that alcohol should be legal. And you can make the same arguments that alcohol is a dangerous drug that, that, that kills people. 
But over the years, that has developed, policy decisions have been made with respect to that. Here we're talking about a very dangerous drug that is illegal to use under any law, either federal or state, and we're talking about the state becoming involved in facilitating the use of that drug. I, I think that is, a, that, is, that is significantly different than uh, a legal substance that the, the state, for, for the policy reasons, for whatever policy reasons that they've, they've legalized alcohol, is significantly different. So I, I, I fundamentally reject the idea that you're, you're, you're equating this with, the al with alcohol use, though, or tobacco use. Let's take another question. Uh, thank you. Well, I, I think that one of the commentators in the beginning of the evening said that uh, everybody on the panel is of the same mind and headed in the same direction, and we all know that that's true of the entire audience. <clears throat> With that in mind, I just want to want to say something and then ask a question. In in my experience, I've I've experienced this very sentiment a number of times before. Uh, the state felt this way about methadone, exactly this way. The state uh, felt this way about buprenorphine, exactly this way. The state felt this way, I mean, the, the citizens of the state felt exactly this way about uh, naloxone or Narcan and uh, safe needle exchanges. So in my history, what's been happening with this epidemic is We've all been forced to stretch our minds and accept things that were at one point unacceptable. And each time we've done that, it saved countless lives. So now on the horizon, it looks like we have uh, safe injection facilities, which, believe me, is a stretch for me. I'm basically abstinence-based and, you know, all enthusiastic about old school recovery. So a lot of this has been a stretch for me, but I've managed to do the stretch. So I guess my question to the entire panel is what, what type of research do we need to access or do in order to get ourselves on a footing where we can feel comfortable actually making a decision? I'd like to respond to that. <laughs> So I think the problem when you get a bunch of law enforcement people and doctors together is you end up focusing on symptoms. And I'm amazed at how, uh, I didn't mean that to be disrespectful, but <laughs> it's supposed to be funny. Um, I'm amazed at how short-sighted we are. Uh, Sarah George made it difficult to talk about cost and resources when you have people stand up in the audience and then say, these people could all die. Um, that's a tough technique. Uh, for argumentation, but what I will tell you is that people are making, we all know, people are making resource decisions all the time. And as an educator, in the past six years of being a principal, I've been responsible for trying to cut $2 million out of various budgets here and there. Um, the Agency of Education in the state of Vermont years ago, uh, like a decade ago, had more than a dozen people focused on prevention and prevention education. Uh, guess how many of those folks are left? Zero. Nobody. Except recently there is uh, a new addition uh, thanks to some of the work of the, the Opioid Council. So that's, that to me is striking. I also look across the state about uh, what SAPs, um, uh, alcohol and drug counselors at schools, um, there, there used to be plentiful positions there. They have been cut back wildly across the state. So we spend a lot of time, we have to talk about resource and where that resource is going. Um, so I, I would urge us to think about, you know, there's got to be a cost analysis here. And, and just from my perspective, please, let's start putting some, some more resource into education. And I know that's hard to argue against, but the education field right now is getting pretty beat up across the state when we talk about property taxes. So, you know, we need to be thoughtful and not just focus on symptoms. So that's just my quick response, which really didn't answer your question. I just took control of this. Does anybody else on the panel want to tackle that? I, I would just say briefly, I, I know that a lot of people that have spoke out against safe injection sites have made a comment about needing more data or needing more information and, and that this is a new concept. But, you know, I, 
have a great quote from Sarah Evans that treating this like a new concept is like saying that Columbus discovered America. Um, it's not true. It's not a new concept. We're actually really far behind on it. Um, other countries have been doing it for 30 plus years. The research is there. We just, for some reason, think that that doesn't, or that doesn't mean that the U.S. can use that research, but we absolutely can. Of course, it's going to be a little different wherever you're doing it, but even within the U.S., it's going to be different in Burlington than one opening in Philadelphia. So, you know, we can work with the research that's there and figure out if this works for us without saying that this is a new concept or that we don't know. Somebody over there had a, yeah, you had a question. Um, I've been trying to wrap my mind around like what's my position personally? Do I agree with this or do I not? And I'm a social worker myself. I've worked for Howard Center for five and a half years. Right now I'm not working for Howard Center, um, but I know a lot of the work that you do, which is excellent work. And I felt really torn in two directions. Um, but I think that this presentation has been extremely informative for me. Um, and I also have loved to hear, um, I'm somebody who likes to have an open mind and I like to hear, um, you know, opinions potentially against mine so that way it could further my understanding and also positions in support of my own so that way I have a more concrete, um, I guess, way to think. Um, and, but what I will say, I, I guess my most important takeaway from today is that I have learned that the research shows that in all of the safe injection sites around the world, there hasn't been any death at, the, at any of those facilities. And I will say that that's an incredible um, fact. And I think that all of us need to remember that. So when I think, do I support this or do I not? Like as a citizen, would I support this? Um, and my answer is yes. I think that right now the opioid epidemic is just getting worse and worse and worse. And I think it's hard for, I know that all of you have excellent experience and we're trying to figure out what to do next, but um, it's really we're trying to figure out should we do this or should we not? And if other countries have done it, like Sarah George said, we're 30 plus years behind. And I think that it would be beneficial in our to the state of Vermont, I think if we could at least maybe try one site, see what happens, and then go from there. Um, again, there hasn't been one single death worldwide in a safe injection site, and I think that that's important to just remember. Thanks. We have two questions over here. So we have one person who's been waiting there, and then Scott, I want to make sure we get to you. So my name is Drew. I have a two-pronged question for Chief Del Pozo. Um, the first, well, I'm not surprised to hear that you're interested in putting more people in the prison system. Um, my question is, do, even if all officers carry Narcan, is the goal to immediately lock them up after reviving them or referring them to treatment? And also, do you really think that a prison environment is better for treatment than a safe injection site would be? So I think there's a little bit of, I, I'm sorry if I haven't clarified uh, my position. First of all, the Good Samaritan Law, which I support, prevents us from locking up anyone. We revive with Narcan, and I think that's great. Uh, second of all, I'm, I'm saying that the, one of the most at-risk populations of dying are people who find themselves in prison for committing serious offenses. And uh, they oftentimes um, you know, go untreated for their addiction, which is the reason that they landed there. Uh, and then when they get out, they're at acute risk. So what I was saying is that we owe our prisoners better, that uh, we don't do the job of adequately rehabilitating them in most prison settings. And I support, um, I, I'm not, uh, what I was saying is that I'm agnostic about where we save the lives, and if we can have a greater impact per dollar on saving lives in prison, then we should, we should look at that. Um, so maybe, maybe I, I wasn't clear, maybe I was using some shorthand because so many folks in the audience, we, we were just having a meeting today where we were, you know, pounding the table for the best possible treatment for prisoners who are uh, suffering from drug abuse. But um, I think one of the things to, um, to try to wrap our heads around is you can have a safe injection facility where no one has ever died, which is true and very compelling, but still have it have very modest population level effects. And I think that that's just something that we have to, to reconcile, that we may be surprised or frustrated how modest the effects are 
when we have the site that we might see a small decrease in mortality when we're hoping for a, a much bigger one. Um, the, the flip to asking, eight, there were about 76 people in this room, plus or minus two people, depends on who's using the bathroom. And, um, and I would say to you if, that everybody in this room stand up. Okay, you're all going to die. And then there's another room half this size where also everyone's going to die. And the state just can't pick the row it likes until that row is sit down. The state has an obligation to say, with what we can do, how do we get everybody to sit down? And so that's not precluding safe injection. It's saying be prepared for very modest effects and have another set of, of plans that complement it so that we all get to, to sit down because everybody is, is, is somebody's you know, loved one. So um, I, I'm just, I'm not, again, I'm, what I'm calling for just to clarify is just preparation at, at th this is a modest thing in the time of a crisis and we need to, if we do it, we need to do a lot, lot more. And if it becomes a resource question, we need to be careful. Hello. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. It's, it's great to see as many people as there are in this room. My name is Scott Pavic. Um, I began using opiates when I was 16. Um, I got clean when I was 21, and I'm 26 now. I recently celebrated five years clean. No. 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 In the past 10 years that this has dominated my life, I've watched beautiful, amazing, talented, kind, compassionate, smart, funny people die. In a lot of ways, it feels like that's all I've been doing with my time. Um, so I'm really grateful that we're having this conversation about saving lives. I wish it had happened earlier so more people could have been here with me. I don't have a question. I wanted to provide an answer. Um, I know there's a, a lot of anxiety about what sort of message would this send to our community. Um, back in November, Commissioner Anderson, you, you released a statement that said this would send the wrong message at the wrong time to the wrong people, I believe. Um, my sister's 14. I would never let her walk into this. And uh, I'll tell you how I talked to her about this and, and what message safe consumption sites would send to our communities. It's very clear. It's very simple. And fortunately, we're the messengers, so we get to decide what we say. Here's what we would be saying. If you are sick, you do not need to die in the street. No matter how badly you are hurting, you do not need to die alone. That's it. Thank you. One question I want to add here is, it often gets presented as an either or. If we do safe consumption, that's taking resources from somewhere else. Is that a true scenario because I've never heard in all of this discussion whether adding a safe injection site in Burlington takes resources from other some other part of either treatment or prevention or education and I, I take your point Adam about adding resources in other places but it seems to be presented as an either or we have safe injection sites but then we don't have X and is, is that true in the way we're thinking of this even in in our um, conversations about how it would work Maybe nobody knows the answer to that. I don't think it has to be. I mean, I, 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 it, it doesn't. I just think we have to be cognizant of the, the, the relative opportunity costs. And, and um, it would be great if we were, you know, an affluent community with, with a lot of extra money. I, I think the, it, it would be something. Um, it's not going to be a horseman of the apocalypse. Vancouver is still a destination for uh, folks all over. The, there's still great skiing nearby. It's still There's so much going on there for... Example, I, 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 I'm, so I think that's right, Jane. Like you can't say either or, but you also can't just say, let's throw it over the fence and see what happens. I think we have to be a little, just candid and responsible. We have one more minute. So let's take one more question if somebody has one and then we can wrap it up. And Thank you. Um, I'm Jolinda LeClaire. I oversee the Governor's Opioid Coordination Council. And full disclosure, there are three members of the council sitting up there, Commissioner Anderson, Principal Bunting, and Commissioner Levine. Um, tremendous conversation here today. It, it is true, going to your last question, um, that 
when there is a certain amount of money, it does get spread across. And the tobacco money that is on the table right now for the state of Vermont to consider and legislators who are here in the audience today will be making tough decisions along with the, with the um, administration about how to use those funds for prevention, intervention, education, treatment, recovery, and enforcement. So it's really a six-legged stool, whether it is state money or it is federal money. With that aside, um, stigma has been mentioned once today, and education has been mentioned numerous times. And I'm really interested to know from all of you, how do we replicate forums like this where we do educate people. Chittenden County you, and Howard Center do a fabulous job having these public forums. I can tell you when you go into the more rural parts of the state in the Northeast Kingdom, in Southern Vermont, these forums are not happening the same way where it's safe for people to have these conversations. So I think that's one of our other challenges as well as a very big opportunity. Everybody up for a road show? <laughs> we talked about the bus we could take, Chief Delpozo. Yeah, um, if, if I could just, um, yeah. to what Jolinda just said, I think that, and back to your kind of spending question, I think that that's true with regards, or it could be true with regards to the budget and the state's budget, but, you know, just uh, last week, um, the Attorney General announced he got a $28 million settlement, and he's putting $14 million of that towards the opioid crisis. So there are other ways, and frankly, you know, for me, if this is truly a public health crisis, UVM Medical Center has money that <laughs> we know they can, you know, there are other places, and frankly, if I knew the amount, I'd go out and fundraise for it if that's what we needed to do. I think to think that this is just how much taxpayer money is this going to cost is unfair. I think that there's other places in the state that we have money that we could use towards this or we could find it. Commissioner Levine, it looked like you wanted to say something. Well, just to sort of build on that, um, there are so many places money can go, and Jolinda referred to all the different efforts, prevention, recovery, et cetera. Um, we've got treatment kind of down in Vermont. We figured it out. Uh, it's kind of funded pretty well, and people are having ready access to it. So the interest really in the Opioid Council, but also really across government, is trying to invest in some of these other areas. And hopefully, in the areas that we find there's the greatest evidence to warrant the investment. This issue that we're here for tonight has, I think, uh, from my standpoint, mixed reviews when it comes to evaluating the current literature. And a lot of it really becomes more of an issue of passion. And we find that people get very polarized. It's either I'm for it or against it, and I think it's really hard to be one way or the other in an extreme direction because there's a lot of questions here. And even though it's had 30 years experience elsewhere, it's had zero in the United States and it has tremendous uh, hurdles to get over just to become operational. And we could choose, like we often do in Vermont, to be on the innovator and early adopter side of the equation and not be laggards on the uh, opposite end of the spectrum. And I'm personally very comfortable with that if that's what we as a cohesive group can decide on as opposed to real polarized opinions. Uh, but we really have to understand that even in a place like Seattle where they've spent years planning and trying to get this underway, it is still not open. And they're still getting over a number of these, whether they be legal or other barriers that I've talked about, uh, to make it operational. And I personally, in viewing this uh, as a crisis, if you will, want to do the things that we can do now and implement. And there are a lot more things that I'm finding we have great evidence for, poor funding of, that could use uh, a little boost uh, that I'd love to uh, direct funds to and really try to succeed. And if this comes around to a point where nationally it's something that we can actually get through, um, wonderful. Because even though we know our legislature often does things that no other legislature will do in the country, there are still federal things that have to be done to make this uh, real time. So I just have those kind of concerns. 
and I, I really do, $14 million goes really fast when you start thinking of big programming and have lots of uh, sort of passion for what you want to do with it. Um, but there's plenty of places to spend that money uh, that hopefully can prevent at least the next generation from having the ills that the current generation of people with this disorder uh, have shown us. I want to make sure I'm respectful of everyone's time, including our guests, and so we're going to end it here. Um, I want to thank all of you for attending. I want to remind you that the Howard Center has other community education series. You can find them in your packets. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to Howard Center for convening this. And thanks very much to our panel for sharing their insight and expertise. Thank you, Jane. If people could go ahead and fill out their feedback forms, we'd be very appreciative. Thank you for coming. Safe travels home. That's really weird. It's very strange. It's all under your thing. I'm like, what? <laughs> Wait, you got, I didn't even get a thing. You got it.